Happy Sunday, everybody. This is Donnie B. Got the Beats. We live here on Two Flu West along with my brother, Nicholas Baker. What's going on with you, bro? What's good? What's good? How you doing? Hey, man, living the best life. Living the best life. We letting the planes fly, bro. We, you know you know how we do. Got to let them fly each and every Sunday. <laughs> every Sunday at 3 p.m. to be exact on the Pacific time. But li listen, we got somebody very, very exceptional today. Uh, sister here, man. Uh, listen, uh, met her a long time ago. Long time ago, and why, man? And uh, you know, we, we chopped it up back then. But this sister since has gone, and she's she's just tearing the airways up right now. Uh, made, made a dope brand for herself, man, and definitely somebody that we humble to be, uh, you know, that they have on the show. Uh, film critic and founder, CEO of BlackGirlNerds.com, Jamie Brodnax. Miss Brodnax, how you doing today? I'm not good. Happy to be here. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to recall the event where we all hung out years oh, ago. What was that? That was a uh, New Year's Eve. Right? It was New Year's Eve. Yeah. I think all of us are trying to recall some of that. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> Me probably more so than everybody else. <laughs> Gosh. Good oh, times. Good, good times. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you doing out there, Jim? Doing good. I'm. I'm not in New York anymore. I miss New York. Um, I'm in Virginia. But um, I'm doing well. Things are great. You know, I look forward to traveling again whenever this crazy pandemic, you know, dies down and decides to get rid of itself. Um, but I would love to go back to the city and, you know, travel like I used to. Indeed. You would, so does that mean you want to uh, get vaccinated? Yeah, I'm waiting. I'm, my mom hasn't even been vaccinated yet. She's still waiting for her appointment. I know. I know. Folks are taking their time around here. So, <laughs> I, had, you know, I had a, a, a interesting conversation around that with some friends, like, because in Cali, it just seems like, at least in the Bay, it seems like there are a lot of appointments and vaccinations and, and they're ready to go. But then I talked to others and it's like, man, it's hard. And you got to play like, you know, I was talking to them and they were like, we had to play a game of shuffle to try to find it, to try to find an appointment. Um, to be able to get it. And they were in uh, Maryland. And I'm just like, wow, it's just crazy how different areas are seeing different experiences, which I mean, I guess that's not crazy because it's probably the norm on a lot of different fronts, but. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing it depends on how severe the cases are. State mm -hmm. state. I mean, our governor, luckily he handled it quite well. Like he shut down stuff really early and mm -hmm. we didn't get it nearly as bad as I mean, California got it pretty bad. And New York got it pretty bad. So, um, you know, Texas, all those states. But, uh, yeah, it, you know, I've just been staying in the house. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to stay, stay indoors. Luckily, I have a home-based business. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I, I do miss going outside. I miss, you know, traveling, all that fun stuff. So, yeah. When them doors open up, it's gonna be a problem. Everybody gonna be gone. It's gonna be lit. <laughs> People gonna yeah. go crazy and wild. <laughs> they, they already started the SoCal man, and and the, uh, the 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 stimulus started coming back, so people out and out of the <laughs> Yes. People got them stimulus and went right on the website to get them tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be mad at it. Yeah, well, so Jamie, talk to us. So let our fans know, man. Like, who is Jamie Broadnax? Oh wow, what a fully loaded question. Who is Jamie Broadnax? Um, Jamie Broadnax, um, as you mentioned in your intro, is the founder and CEO of BlackGirlNerds.com. Um, she's a self-declared nerd and geek. It wasn't a term that she always embraced. Um, you know, it was something that I think over time. I adopted it just because I pretty much found myself being someone who's, you know, socially uh, inept at times. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm a bookworm. I, I rather stay home and, you know, play on, on the computer um, and just surf the web or, you know, build on websites and things like that than to, you know, hang out at parties and stuff. 
of that nature. So just various things. And then sort of in the comic book, the pop culture realm of nerd culture, I grew up on X-Men. I grew up on a lot of comics. Um, so yeah, that's, that's who Jamie Broadnax is in, in a nutshell. And um, she just got really lucky by Googling the term black girl nerds and, you know, uh, decided to create a blog space that represented women that, you know, she saw herself through. So yeah, it's weird talking about myself in third person. But. <laughs> <laughs> Donnie's used to it because Donnie loves to do such a thing. <laughs> it's, right. it's, like, it's like The Rock. <laughs> the right. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let me ask you, I, I don't want to, you know, tell, you know, blow your spot up, but we all test your, your the limits of your geekdom. Okay. Like, so, like, are you? Would you say you are a fan of Star Trek or Star Wars, or both? Well, both, but more Star Wars than Star Trek, just because that's what I grew up on. So, and I had the toys and all of that stuff. So, yeah, okay. I love okay. both franchises. Yeah, because you know, you know, when you start talking that 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 lingo and stuff like that, and you you, you talk about the world, like you, you uh, what's the uh, Lord of the Rings, you, you start talking about the the well, this is the Elvish shit, this is the you know what I mean, like the the, the jargon of certain things. So, do you have? Are you one of those type of type of uh, you know uh, nerds? Because I'm I'm nerd, I'm a nerd, I'm a huge nerd. So, <laughs> that is, that is, you know what I'm saying? But like, do you get deep into that type of stuff? Yeah, I mean, I don't speak Klingon. I don't, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not that far deep into it. But, you know, there's there's definitely some lingo that I definitely have adopted into my vocabulary. Like even the word blurred, right? Okay. The portmanteau term for black nerd is something that has been a part of my vernacular and really part of my brand for, you know, the last, I would say, almost decade. Um, so yeah, you know, um, there's kind of, I can't think of any others at right at the moment, but there's differently, there's definitely some like geeky jargon that, you know, I adopt into my vernacular here and there. <laughs> That's awesome. I had to think about that question too, Donnie. I was like, I don't know. I think I might be a star, a star Trek. Like Captain Kirk was a cold dude, man. He's yeah. like, <laughs> oh, no, no love for Cisco though. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm Captain Kirk all the way. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's the OG. He's the OG. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. He go to any planet and find a date. I don't know how he make it happen, but he would have. You, <laughs> he just go to any planet and find a date. Be like, all right, whatever works. Yeah, he was cold with it. He was cold with it. Yeah, interesting. Um, but you yeah, know, as with regard to uh, black girl, black girl nerds. Uh, tell us about how it started. Like, what what was the the mindset? Like, I, I know you 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 touched on it by saying you know you you googled it and you know researched to see if it was available and so forth and so on. But how did it like in in its inception? How did what made you say, hey, this is a space I want to you know I want to do? Yeah, I mean, I guess what led me to wanting to Google it was um, going to these fan and pop culture sites. Uh, that would talk about my favorite fandoms like comic books and you know occasionally gaming and and things of that nature but i would always see white women represented obviously a lot of white men is represented predominantly um, but i rarely saw black women and um i just thought wow it would be really cool to see a space for women like me um and i had a facebook fan page called black girl nerds and it was getting some you know, follows or likes or whatever. Um, so that was kind of building up. And I just one day I decided to go on Google and put in the term black girl nerds and nothing came up. And that's when I realized, okay, this is a problem. <laughs> and even in Google search images, when I typed in black girl nerds, images of white women wearing glasses with black frames would come up. Mm. So even the image of a black woman self-identified as a nerd, the Google algorithm didn't even identify that. So yeah, I, I... ever occur to you that me? Oh, sorry. Man. <laughs> Good morning. That just happened. So that was a commercial break, real quick. <laughs> commercial break. YouTube ad break. Yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Don't you love that? You're in the middle of watching something on YouTube and then those ads just cut right into it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so then I just went on to um, 
uh, Google and when nothing came up, I decided to create a blog page and went on blogger.com, created the account. It was really just what a blog was at the time, which was a personal diary, personal web diary. And I would just talk about my own musings on geek culture. And um, it just grew. And by growth, it, it was something that literally happened overnight within I think 24 to 48 hours, a girl emailed me um, and said, hey, I would I saw your site. Uh, I would like to write content, you know, with you on your site. And then it just started to blow up from there. Um, so, yeah, that's what led me to create Black Girl Nerds. I mean, I had no idea that it'd be what it is today, obviously, but um, I'm honored and I'm just so blessed and proud that this platform is something that a lot of women have been able to see themselves in and have been attracted to and that they have been consistently followers and fans of this brand um because you know it's we've been out here in these web streets for quite a long time so um <laughs> it's great and and you you you've, you've uh, garnered some major attention from some 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 pretty powerful people right Yes, I think it was in 2014 in uh, Marie Claire magazine where Shonda Rhimes gave me a random just shout out and I was shocked because I knew she was following me on Twitter, which that in and of itself was a huge accomplishment. Um, but to have her say that I was one of her favorite Twitter accounts to follow uh, was just wild. Um, so and she's been a huge mentor and just admirer of, i've been an admirer of hers from afar um since gray's anatomy is like one of my favorite shows of all time so um yeah that was an amazing thing to to see and recognize and, and we've had a lot of celebrities just follow the account um and you know tweet with us and engage with us i've been able to get interviews just from sliding into them dms on occasion <laughs> and, um it's been great it's been a great ride so I'm I'm honored and humbled by it. You should be. I mean, like you said, you you you've maximized a, a huge space. There was a huge goal. I mean, a, a hole, and you you filled it, and, and it's awesome, man. Like just to be able to see it, like, hey, wow, you know what I mean? And and and, and especially with the the film space, uh, you know, it's always that's water cooler talk. It's like something that you know everybody does. It's like talking sports. So to ab absolutely see a hole with that, and then fill it with, uh, you know. Black love and, 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 you know, sisters and, you know, it's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, I'm, I'm so proud of the community that's been built over the years. I'm also proud of the women that's worked for the publication and then being able to move on to other opportunities because of black girl nerds. Um, so to just say that I'm a part of someone's growth, whether it's as a journalist, as an editor, um, <clears throat> You know, it 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 means a lot to me because it's you know this is not something I could have ever imagined for myself, and the fact the fact that I'm you know creating this you know impression upon people and um, and helping to build their you know helping to build opportunities for other people that that is definitely something I didn't see coming. So it's it's been great. Okay, okay, Baker, you got any thoughts? I'm look. I'm. Um, I feel like I'm. I'm in the show, but I'm also listening. Like, <laughs> uh, like I'm learning and listening. It's like, it, it's awesome. Um, tell us a little bit more. Like, I know you have um, blackgirlnerds.com. I know there's a podcast. Like, tell us like, kind of the expansion of Black Girl Nerds. Like, how it kind of broke into those pieces. Um, how did that come about? Yeah. So in 2012, um, February of 2012 is when Black Girl Nerds started. So Black History Month. Um, and then in March of 2013, the following year, um, I started the podcast. And that all happened because um, a friend of mine said, hey, you should look into podcasting. I didn't even know what a podcast was. I literally had to go to Google and search the term to find out what it was. And then um, I launched the Black Girl Nerds podcast in March of 2013. So um, we've been consistently um, uploading episodes ever since then. And um, yeah, you know, managing the website, the, the podcast, um, being known as a Twitter personality with us live tweeting shows. We don't do it as much anymore, but in the past, a lot of people knew about the BGM brand through our Twitter pages. 
And, um, you know, we've been uh, recently putting up a lot of content on YouTube to try to kind of build out that space a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, definitely looking at this as like a multimedia um, company where anybody that's interested in getting content, whether you're a YouTuber, you know, someone who likes to go to YouTube or someone that likes to play on Twitter, or if you just like reading articles on the internet, um, you know, we can be that resource for you. I got a quick kind of build on it question. Um, and then we can, I know we got to move forward to some other questions, but we were talking about like being in the pandemic. Um, how has that like has that helped your brand in any way like more people being home and looking for content has it hurt it or has it kind of just stayed pretty even like how's the pandemic affected um black girl nerds well god is good because i i have to say we've done better in a pandemic than we did pre-pandemic <laughs> um <laughs> You know, it is a home-based business. It's an internet-based business. So we're not like a brick and mortar store where we were shut down or impacted in that way. Um, and there were a lot of organizations that were willing to give to black female entrepreneurs during this time. So we were able to get a lot of help that way. Um, and then a lot of the studios that I've been working with for a lot of years had um, been doing like virtual press junkets and, um, that became, there was more of that coming in as opposed to flying people out or you know having to physically be in a studio to do a junket. So as more of those opportunities came in, that gave us more content for the site. More content for the site, obviously, you know, because we run ads on the site, that's how we monetize. That is what helps us bring in more traffic and more traffic generates more revenue. So, um, we did actually very well in the pandemic and and it's it is a miracle because there are other online digital publications that didn't fare so well in the pandemic so mm -hmm. um you know i'm just grateful that you know we were able to kind of hang in there and keep above water so definitely congrats on that um, congrats on that oh you look, can you mind if I ask a question too? I want to ask a question with specificity, with specificity to the actual cr cr the film critic aspect of it. Being a being a personality, right? Um, <clears throat> a lot of times, uh, it's it's just been you know, and and again, I might be very naive to it, uh, but a lot of times when you know you navigate celebrity or navigate the you know trying to find yourself uh, in your voice. Uh, especially with stuff like being a critic, I, I, I and I assume, um, have you encountered a, a, a situation as to where where you were just speaking your you know your truth about something that uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, production uh, and it, and it came across ne like negative and then you had like somewhat of a negative back backlash from your 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 criticism. So uh, what was the what was an, an experience and you know, like what we should take away from it. Yeah, first movie that comes to mind was Fantastic Four with Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was one of the few people that liked it. I know it was panned by critics, but I liked it. So of course I got accused of liking the film because, you know, Michael B. Jordan is a black Johnny Storm. So, oh, you like it because of that reason. And um, I remember writing an article that in the headline it says, I like Fantastic Four, not because Johnny Storm is black. Uh, <laughs> so I I, um, I remember that being kind of the first wave of you know backlash from fans because yeah. I didn't fall in line with the other film critics on this movie. Um, but uh, what was the second part of that question? I apologize. Just no, no, no worries. Uh, I know it was kind of a loaded question. Um, like I said, uh, what was an, an instance of, of that that backlash, and like how how what was your takeaway from it? Like, did did it teach you anything, or you know, or do, do you look at uh, your criticism differently? Like, I, I you know, I, or, or are you just like a hundred? Like, I'm I'm still a hundred regardless. Like, this is what I believe. This is what that is. You know. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I'm a hundred. You know, I don't fall in line with what the other critics are saying. I, I actually kind of had to uh, politely admonish one of my writers um, who wanted to critique Wonder Woman 1984. 
and there was a lot of aspects of the film that she didn't like about it and then there were aspects of the film that she did like about it and then she was like well i'm looking at the other reviews from the critics and i just don't want to say anything bad about the film i kind of want to just go off of what you know everybody else is saying i'm like that's not how film criticism works right. you know people want to know what your opinion is and even if it is an outlier even if it is completely different from what everybody else is saying that is your opinion that holds weight that holds value um i mean you see i'm, I'm a rotten tomatoes critic but you'll see on rotten tomatoes there will be films where it'll be at 100 percent or you know in the 90s on rotten tomatoes or excuse me backwards it'll be yeah. <laughs> it'll be, you know, 12%, 10%, like it'll be rotten, right? It won't be fresh. And you'll see the fans watch the same film. And then the audience takeaway is like, you know, at a way higher ranking. Right. So um, don't go, I, you know, my takeaway is I don't look at what everybody else is talking about. I'm not swayed by, you know, the studio. <laughs> And, you know, access journalism and any of that stuff. If I hate a movie, I hate a movie. I remember I was flown, my first junket, press junket, I was flown out for Batman versus Superman. I was flown out by Warner Brothers, you know, put me in a hotel. And this was like, you know, this is a standard thing they do for journalists that are outside of Los Angeles. And it was a big deal for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're flying me out to LA and put me in a hotel. And, you know, I get to be in LA for free. And so should I say something bad about this movie? Because this movie sucked, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I held to my guns and I was like, no, I need to be, I need to keep my integrity and be like, this movie is terrible. What are the aspects of it? Technical aspects, directing, performances, all of those things that go into criticism and not be swayed by, you know, the the Hollywood system. Um, mm. So, yeah, it, it, it is something that, you know, I've definitely learned in my journey as a film critic. And I share that with other new film critics that kind of just need to be shown the ropes of, you know, how this whole thing works. But yeah, absolutely being honest and opinion about your opinion, because at the end of the day, people are very smart. People will see, you know, right through you if they see mm -hmm. that you know, you're always actively, you know, giving positive reviews to big studio films. Um, and then obviously, you know, they're not going to see you as a as a valid critic and, and have less respect for you in that way. So, yeah. Baker? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I thought you were I thought you were heading in a direction before I interjected to ask. The oh, no, you were fine. Like, I, look, I told you I'm, I'm like in the interview and I'm like listening and <laughs> like going in and out. I'm like, really, I'm like listening. I feel like I'm like in an out of body experience and part of it because I'm like really learning like oh wow oh yeah that makes sense I see how to like sorry <laughs> yeah, no, right. and, and, and to his point too like uh uh you know I'm kind of in my inner fandom too because I'm like okay yeah I, I I'm very well well versed with you know black well, black uh, girl nerds and you know your your power and your your voice and so forth and so on and he'll tell you like uh I like I just have opinions about everything. So, you know, me trying to understand exactly, you know, you know, I've, I've uh, wrestled with, you know, the, the the responsibility of, hey, this is my voice, it's just how I, I feel, and that's just going to be it, in a verse to, well, you know, maybe I should doctor it up because I'm scared of the backlash, and, you know, so forth and so on. So, I mean, just, you know, I'm listening to, you know what I mean? So, I, I totally understand. What it's, it's hard because people have opinions, people are very opinionated, and if you something especially when it comes to the comic book movies my goodness some of those fans can be rabid sometimes but mm -hmm. you know uh, you got to take it uh, it goes with the territory um if you're not prepared to be a film critic if you're not prepared to take um extensive criticism from the very people that you're you're you know writing to about this film that you have an opinion on then it may not be for you because I feel like you do need to have a thick skin to be in this industry because your your work is obviously very public and it's also being scrutinized and, and torn apart by people that may not like it. And then of course there's always the opposite. People love your review and they and they thank you for writing about this and they feel encouraged to go see the movie because of your review. So there's also the obviously the positive side of it, but it's it's tough. It is. But you know. You gotta stay real. Well, 
in the in the spirit of keeping it real, like we we can't have you here in the middle of a, a award season and not talk about some awards. Um, you know, we want to talk about some award uh, nods, some snubs, some uh, winners, maybe some yeah. people who should have won. Mm -hmm. um, as we're coming up on like the nominations for the Oscars about to be announced, the Golden Globes have already happened. Um, let, let's talk some, let's just talk it out. Like, let's, what do you think? What have you seen? How are you feeling about what you've seen so far? Uh, let's talk it out. Sure. Uh, where do we begin? Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> much to unpack. I mean, I was watching this video on YouTube the other day about how award shows are becoming less and less significant uh, with yeah. the fan base, uh, but just because of this, the way the system is and even the Hollywood Foreign Press being outed recently for no black people on their, among their 87 journalists that comprise of the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Um, and even some people being bought, I didn't even know this, but apparently, yeah. Uh, the people that uh, voted on Emily in Paris, they were flown out to Paris and wined and dined. And, you know, so, I mean, there's kind of like this payola situation almost kind of. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it, it's frustrating to me to see that be a thing because there's so many great films and I'm speaking very specifically to black films and um, films by black filmmakers um, and even just films with people of color, but specifically the black experience um, that just get, you know, snubbed. It doesn't get recognized. I mean, one film that comes to mind, I wrote a piece about it for Black Girl Nerds, is Miss Juneteenth mm -hmm. and Nicole Bahari's stunning performance. Stunning performance. I mean, um, you know, if someone like Amy Adams can be recognized for her work, Mm. Why, are, why are we not looking at uh, Nicole Bahari for Miss Juneteenth? So I just think of that being a problem in the system. And, and, and there's a lot of aspects to that. It doesn't get enough eyes from people that are doing the voting. You know, the people that are behind uh, marketing the film doesn't have the budget to campaign for it because there's like a campaign period for a lot of these films, mm -hmm. uh, which is what allows them to get nominated. So it's so political now. Um, and I mean, it's probably always been political, but because I'm now that I see what the system looks like on the inside, I'm like, wow, this is just not right. Um, so, sorry to get off on that rant, but, uh, oh, thank you. but there, but yeah, I, like that's a movie that I really feel like should have gotten more um, attention. 40 year old version um, Rada Blank, her Netflix film, I think uh, should have gotten way more attention. That was a beautiful, funny, unique film. And even Rada Blank as a director um, should get uh, looked at. I don't know if we're talking about the snubs. I feel like I'm in the snubs category now, but um, you know, that that is a film that I just thought was fantastic. And even like, I think about I May Destroy You and what Michaela Cobalt mm. created. Yeah, that, that was pretty good. Um, that was just, a, such a compelling series and to, for it to not get any kind of recognition from the Golden Globes. Um, but yet like Promising Young Woman, which is like this rape fantasy um, film, it's very mediocre to me. Uh, Carrie mm. Mulligan is being touted as, you know, best actress and Carrie Mulligan, don't get me wrong, great actress, I love her. Um, but this was not her, this is not an awards worthy performance in my opinion. I feel like there's far better actors that did well, like Nicole Bahari, that mm -hmm. should be nominated and um, that should be pushed forward as, you know, um, best actor, you know, actress performances. So, yeah. Right. Let me ask you, where does the rubber hit the road to you when, when we're talking about, since, we, we, since we're talking about Black film, right? And we talk about Black black cinema mm -hmm. um, or, you know, Black screen, I guess I should, I should say, uh, in a verse to the obligation of, I guess, feeling like we need to represent and support to putting it alongside credible production, if that makes sense. Because yeah. a lot of times, you know, you look at stuff and you be like, okay, I mean, but it's black though, so I kind of want to really big up it. But really, like, uh, you know, and, and not to be straightforward, but like, you can't put lipstick on a pig, right? So, right. It, it, you know what I mean? Like, where for you, where does the rubber hit the road for you 
when you're making these um, um, uh, criticisms about about film and making sure that you're 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 still on top of your you know protecting your your brand and your interest. I mean, what I do is, if it's a film that I know isn't that good, rather than criticize the film, I try to amplify the work of the director by interviewing them or you know interviewing some of the cast. So I go down that path rather mm. than completely just slam a film and then prevent people from wanting to see it. Because then you get that situation sometimes where you do critique a film and you say it's bad, you know, and you have all of these litany of issues that you have with the movie and the people just don't go see it. And that's counterintuitive to what I'm trying to do with my platform. So I find other ways to amplify that filmmaker mm. and find the film as mediocre or just not good at all. Um, but I am honest with some films. There are some like, especially like, like big black studio films that if it's not good, then I'll say it's not good. <laughs> um, so I remember um, the movie Stepsisters with Madeline mm. Ichikawoke and Lena Waithe was a producer. And I I was battling whether or not I wanted to write a review for this because I'm such a huge fan of Lena Waithe and I didn't want to, you know, and she was a follower, you know, she still is. She follows Black Girl Nerds on Twitter. I'm like, I don't want to offend. I don't want her to unfollow. Like, I mm. But, you know, I was honest. I hated the movie. I didn't like it. Um, so, you know, there are those moments for me as a film critic. But then there are other moments where I'm like, let's go into a different direction and find a way to uplift you um, without completely just, you know, demolishing your, your film on our site. Because that's not what we that's not what we're here for. So. Fair. Now, it, it, and, and the one last thing it, it, with regard to that, like, so my my nomination or whatever in the category as far as specific item malcolm and marie honestly i don't know where i feel with it be kind of be quite honest with you like i love it but i kind of hate it because it's just like i love it i love what it what it, what it what it's symbolizing I, I love the feel of it the the, the it's like avant-garde type of deal you know what i mean kind of like under the cherry moon mm -hmm. but Maybe because it's black and white, maybe, but but it also too was just like bro, like I, I it's so many I could have did something else like for the last hour or some change, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so, I, you know maybe that's just me hitting hard. Maybe I shouldn't, but that's you know what I mean. So what what do you feel about uh, Michael and Marie? What's your thought? I didn't get a chance to write a review for that one, but if I did, I would have given it a rotten. I didn't like it. Um, I know that film is also getting, you know, pushed, you know, getting a lot of big ups, I guess, from the Hollywood community. I mean, mm -hmm. I know Zendaya did a fantastic job. I will give her her flowers for that. She definitely did the damn thing with her performance. I just didn't find anything compelling about the script. Uh, there were moments where, you know, John David Washington's character was monologuing and I was just like, okay, are we done? <laughs> and um, I, it just, it, to me, the film just wasn't that interesting enough. It's not a film that you're going to be talking about five years later. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And that, I think about that in my head when I'm writing a review or if I'm even thinking of voting for a film. Is this a film that people are going to be talking about years from now? Is this going to still resonate with people later on down the road? And right. Malcolm and Marie just didn't do it for me. I, I feel like, um, you know, it got a lot of buzz and press because it was filmed during COVID and, and that was like a big deal. Um, right. So it's more of a, one of those Hollywood movies where they're just trying to shove it down your throats and trying to get you to like it. And then you realize, but what are we supposed to like? What, <laughs> there's nothing really here. There's nothing substantive about this story, these characters. I, I don't like either one of them. Um, there's nothing really redemptive about their story at the end. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm very clear on the fact that I did not like Malcolm and Marie. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I would get <laughs> like I said, I, I like it, but I didn't like it. So, yeah. It's funny, like in listening to um you both speak on it, I think your explanation of is it a good movie or not around like, are people gonna think about this five years from now? Like um, 
that's a great way to think about it. Cause like for me, I think it was a good conversation starter. Um, and I had a very like interesting conversation with a group of couples around, like we were talking about, is that good communication? Right. But that doesn't necessarily, it's, that doesn't mean it's a good movie. It just had a topic that could come up off of it. And we talked about it a lot, but right. thinking about it in that way, I mean, I, it definitely had its moments. Like you said, Zendaya definitely, I think, crushed the role and like, you know, gave a great performance. Um, uh, you know, I think, again, it was one of those movies that, like you said, this this argument isn't over yet. Like, Right. Really happening? Like, why are we still? <laughs> or like, don't leave her alone. Don't come back and start. Oh, Lord, you left her alone. Now you're about to argue again. <laughs> so, you know. Um, but like that, that's a great way to think of it. Because like, again, I think I was giving too much credit to the conversation that it started mm -hmm. uh, with that group of couples and thinking, oh, it was a great piece. Yeah. Um, good way to think about it, though. Yeah, I mean, I'm it's, taking it's, these nuggets right now. Had it been like three or four scenes of them arguing, then, you know, it'd be a film that would be easily digestible for me. But the fact that it's two hours of them arguing, it just got redundant. And yeah. over time, I just lost interest. So that's, that's inevitably what sealed its fate as far as it not being a film critically that I could, you know, co-sign on saying it's a great film. But performances wise, I, I thought, um, Zendaya did a fantastic job. So, yeah, I, it, it's funny. I just, I, I just saw Cherry today, and uh, you know, obviously, her and 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 uh, uh, Tom Holland had like a little whatever do that for for a second, and I was just like, you know, it's funny to see both of them in that play that role because you know Zendaya did uh, Euphoria, right? You know, and Tom Holland now is with Cherry with the you know, dealing with addiction and so forth and so on, and it's like you know, looking at both of those those, uh, it's like. To me, I'm like they're the, like the flagship of the new generation of of new 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 talent, and I thought that they did, but they both did really well in those roles to be able to personify that, that you know that that character. But like you said with Malcolm and Maria, it's like okay, I get it, and it's risky and it's dope. Um, you know, it's elegant the way it looks, the way it feels. Yeah. But like you said. I'm good after about a good 20 minutes. I don't even, like, even just in real life, I don't want to, if I'm arguing more than 20 minutes, I'm, I have lost interest. I'm ready to go. Like, we, we, it's not, you know what I mean? And then even at the end, it's like, you know, no, no. Spoiler alert, first of all. <laughs> oh, you know, at the end, it's like, okay, she's gone. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, I like it. And then it's like, she's on a cliff. Like, what's happening? Like, what are we doing? Like, you know what I mean? Like, is she going to jump off now? Like, what, I, you know, it was just, it was like, it was a true cliffhanger, huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, bro, the whole time you didn't get up and look out the window, she's standing right there, bro. Like, what's happening? Like, you know, uh, I don't get it. You know what I mean? So it, it it had a lot to be desired, left to be desired with that for me. That that, but yeah. So how about so, this? Um, any winners like from the Golden Globes? I guess we'll say that you just really felt they hit the the nail on the head. Like, that's exactly who I thought should win it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. Obviously, Chadwick Boseman's performance in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom was just out of this world. Mm -hmm. And for all of the naysayers out there that are saying, oh, they're only giving him an award because he passed away. No, he did a fantastic job because I think they also were campaigning for him in The Five Bloods. And I didn't like it. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't like the five bloods. Um, yeah. and, I I didn't didn't think <laughs> and his performance in that was strong enough to merit um, an award. So if he was only in that movie and not Ma Rainey's, then I'd be like, I don't think so. I'm sorry. But Chadwick really just gave his all in that performance. So um, I will be shocked <laughs> if he is not nominated for an Oscar. Um, but he's definitely, he definitely deserved the wins for, um, you know, Golden Globe. He also won a Critics' Choice Award. Um, so that was well-deserved. Um, and even that film as a best picture is worthy, I think, of a nomination. It, it, it's just a beautiful film, inside and out. Great story, great performances, great cinematography, great makeup. You know, mm -hmm. Viola Davis just completely just was a chameleon <laughs> as Ma Rainey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everything about that movie is is absolutely brilliant. Um, um, I mean, some other performances, you know, uh, Daniel Kaluuya and Judas and the Black Messiah. I know he's getting a lot of recognition for that. 
Sure. Personally, the film for me, I, I felt very mediocre about it. It's not a strong film, but he definitely did a really great job as, as a performer. Um, so he he deserves the accolades. And also, I'm really glad that John Boyega is getting attention and respect and getting uh, awards for Red, White, and Blue for the Small Acts uh, series. Because in my opinion, I think that's the best performance of his career. Um, I just, he really blew me away when I saw his performance in that. Um, what's unfortunate though is, you know, Steve McQueen not getting recognized for putting out five movies, <laughs> mm -hmm. right. you know, with the small mm -hmm. act um, anthology. So, uh, you know, I don't know. We, we'll see what happens with Oscar nominations, but um, definitely um, John Boyega did definitely did some amazing stuff with that. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Andrew Day for <laughs> United States versus Billy Holiday. Billy Holiday. Yeah. I I absolutely love that performance. I actually saw the documentary called Billy, mm -hmm. and um, you know it's such a tragic story, Billy Holiday's story. But um, just listening to the archival and watching the archival footage of Billy Holiday speak, and Andrew Day sounds exactly like her. I mean, this woman really just went far deep into the role. And then I had read that she had never smoked a day in her life and mm -hmm. smokes through like 90% of the movie. And so she definitely um, deserves all the awards for that performance. Absolutely. Definitely dedication. Well, I got to ask about what are your thoughts on uh, One Night in Miami? Oh, I love that movie. I actually um, thought that everybody the ensemble cast like everybody did a great job i mm -hmm. do like eli gory who played mm -hmm. ali i like mm -hmm. his performance more than everybody else's just because he really sounded like him and he really mm -hmm. had a lot of his you know he he emoted uh muhammad ali so much in that role um but i know ben king's ladir is kind of sort of the standout one that everybody's looking at um you know, with his performances, Malcolm X. And, um, you know, I, Regina King definitely deserves to at least get acknowledged for her best director, um, for directing the film, because it was it was magnificent. I mean, it's, some people argue and say, oh, well, you know, it's just them in a hotel room and that doesn't really take much direction, but I think it does take a lot of direction to, um, direct actors, to be an actor's director. I mean, I think that that's a skill in and of itself, not just being a technical director and focusing on landscapes and, you know, um, wide shots, kind of like what Chloe Zhao is being rec recognized for in Nomadland. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I I think that Regina King should deserve some more acknowledgement for, for her uh, work on that film. Definitely agree with that wholeheartedly. I have a question to pose, uh, kind of to both of y'all, but like really to start a discussion. Um, I mean, we talk in, in talking about kind of the excellence we're seeing in like black films um, and more stories coming to the big screen, even small screen. Like, I think there's this known factor, even because this is happening in the Grammys to to some extent. We'll kind of pick on that, but um, this unfair system and like recognition and, and it not happening. Um, I had a conversation again, I have a lot of other conversations, but, um, and there was this thought of why do we still go after that recognition? Like why, you know, why is that still have to be the standard, right? Um, like, how do you feel about that? Do you think at some point we should, it should just be like, you know what, whatever, when it comes to some of those um, bigger awards or like should, I mean, the system should change and, you know, be more level. But is there ever a point where it's just like, whatever, like, you know what, those don't matter anymore um, in this, in that kind of art form? Like, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. And that's such a good question. I feel like I touched on a little bit earlier about just how the system is not always filled with a lot of integrity when it comes to the voting part of it. But um, I mean, Award shows have been a long legacy and, you know, it's been a part of our history as film uh, geeks and folks that just really pay attention to these films throughout the year. So I, I don't fully want that to go away because I, 
and I especially want to see, you know, more recognition of, you know, black folks and people of color to be seen, you know, as far as direction and acting in their performances. But the system needs to change. You know, HFPA needs yeah. to have more black folks. Um, the academy, you know, that does the voting need to be more inclusive. Um, there are black films being made, so it's not like they're not being made, they're just not being recognized. So there needs to be more campaigning for black films when it comes to award season. Um, so I just feel like the system needs to be a little bit more diverse and more inclusive, um, less corrupt in that way, where people are being flown out to Paris, you know, to vote on <laughs> a show that's so mediocre, um, and just vote based off of you know, the actual integrity of the series or the film. Like, obviously, is this good because the actor is good? Because it's got really great direction, great costumes, you know, all the technical aspects. So look at what, you know, the film is actually representing and not because, you know, some big Hollywood studio wined and dined you to, you know, go ahead and vote for it. So I just feel like, you know, to sum up what I'm saying is fix the system, let it be inclusive, let it be diverse and keep these award shows, you know, going and maybe even have more, you know, awards and accolades recognized to performers throughout the year and mm -hmm. not hold, you know, three or two specific shows up to this huge high standard. Um, Cause yeah, then I don't know, sometimes you set people up for failure if they think that that's what they need in order to be successful as a director or as an actor. Yeah, I got a glimpse of something like I, I spoke to the Grammys real quick and like I got a glimpse of something this morning where um, I guess there was some snubs in the Grammys, but uh, Cardi B uh, put up a post about a bunch of independent black artists who got like some first nods and was just stating like, you know, just because certain things didn't get it, don't disregard these artists who did get a nod and like, you know, try to rain on their parade because there were some some great some great music that did get some nods. So it's I think it's always been like a weird balance of trying to figure out what it needs to look like. Cause sometimes I think they can I've seen it go overboard where there's this overcompensation and it's like one year where it's like, oh, everything is gonna be black. And it's like, yeah, that's what we did. See, see, we fixed it. And then wow. the next four years it won't be and then we'll have another black year. And it's like if we could just land in the middle, like you said, if it really just like make it just look at the art, like yes. whatever the art is and judge that and like do that fairly. Mm -hmm. And then I think people could be like, okay, if, if it, you know, if it didn't win and it's something better, it's something better or for whatever reasons. Um, but when there's this like known corruption and this known um, like where it's not fair, like that's that line that I just, I don't know. I would love to see a change. I don't know how it, what that looks like, but. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I got thoughts on it, but I'm like uh, that'll that'll give us another 20 minutes to conversate. <laughs> so you know, efforts of time. I'm just going not even going to say what I'm about to say. But now I definitely appreciate both of you guys' uh, perspectives on that because I th that that's true, and I almost wish that, that that there was like a summit that we can have where people can we we can all kind of just leverage the playing field and let's just talk about the topics and issues. To in order to because I don't think it's all Hollywood. That's just my belief. I just don't think it's all Hollywood that that they're, 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 it, and that's why we have that disparity. It's like at the end of the day, too, we have a uh, a responsibility too to make sure that we doing our part on on our end as far as the creatives to match what's what's that's like me saying you know well you know you don't got nobody like me that's like you know winning awards like Jay Z. And it's like, but at the end of the day, if you were putting out work that was credible, that was close on its own, the product alone, if, uh, like what, uh, what uh, Russell Simmons used to say, if the product doesn't have integrity, then what are you selling really, basically? You know what I mean? And, and that's just how I feel with film, too. It's just like at the end of the day, some stuff is just like, like I said, can't put a lipstick on a pig. You know what I mean? Like, And, and again, that's no shot. I, I think everybody has an art and a direction to it. But, you know, for me, it's just one of those things is the worst, like, Okay, Anton Fuqua did uh, Mag uh, Magnificent Seven. That was pretty good. You know what I mean? Now, you know, the director do Magnificent Seven, and it's like uh, underwhelming, then it's like, you know, kind of whatever. 
I, I maybe I'm saying too much, but you know that's neither here nor there. Um, moving moving the gauge uh, the the need a little bit. What are your thoughts on coming to America, coming to America? I feel like at this point I'm sounding so negative on these films that we're talking about <laughs> because I did not like this movie at all. Not good. I didn't either. Well, what was your reason for not liking the movie? Um, you know, look. I'm not a fan of reboots anyway to begin with or sequels. Uh, if, if a film is great, just let it be great. Don't try to make it a cash grab, you know. Um, I get that they were trying to pay a lot. Basically, this was a fan service movie. You know, forget about the plot. <laughs> forget about, you know, story structure. Let that all just, you know, go by the wayside. This was a fan service movie. And, um, I guess that's why I didn't like it because I was expecting something a little bit more substantive. I was expecting, you know, an actual compelling plot and I didn't get that. Uh, there was too much going on. They threw way too many people into this movie and it was just sort of all over the place. I really wish they would have focused on the daughter more than the son um, of Akeem. And I didn't like the fact that they made Prince Akeem into this misogynist, you know? Mm. Um, he was very much the opposite, like he was less progressive and very much more conservative than his character in the first film. And I'm like, if that's the case, explain to us what happened between then and now to make him this way. Because, you know, obviously he was very progressive in the fact that he decided to leave his kingdom and go to America to find an, a wife, you know, who was American, which, you know, now we know with the whole Meghan Markle and Prince Harry situation, apparently that's a very controversial thing. Um, race aside, but yeah, I think that the film overall just, it just fell flat and um, I I felt like it just didn't need to be made. But at the same time, it it was nice to see some of the old people from the first film back. Like it, it was nice to have those nostalgic moments so I'll give it credit for that, you know, uh, you know, and even them using some of the lines from the first film and everything and like the guys at the barbershop. And yeah. so that that was kind of nice, um, but it just it didn't land for me as a film that you again, like this is this is the way I always think as a critic. Is this a movie that you're going to remember <laughs> many years from now? Coming to America, obviously, that's an iconic movie. Most of us know almost every line from that movie. I don't think we're going to be repeating lines from Coming to America this evening. Yeah. I agree. You Very agree. true. You I'll jump in. So we have a don't like, kind of like, don't like sandwich going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, one, um, Coming to America is like one of my favorite movies, the original. Um, so definitely when you say fan service, I a hundred percent agree. Um, I definitely think it was like, you know, we got a kind of cult following to this movie. Let's make something for that group, um, that touches on all the things that that one, you know, had, um, all the little like nods that you talked about with the barbershop scene and even the two rap, the, the, the twin rappers and going back to them, uh, you know, how he got, you know, has a son and like how all of that happened. It was like, definitely like, okay, <laughs> y'all stretched it some, but what, you know, at the same time, I was like, as a fan, like I, I said this last week, I was like, I felt like I looked in on some friends I haven't seen in, in a while. And it's like, oh, okay, this is what happened with them. Oh, the barbershop is still there. Wow. That's crazy that they're still there. It was like, it was like going back to an old neighborhood and seeing, how things changed, right? But that was it. I don't think I was expecting it to be more. And that's why it landed for me. Cause it was like, it did exactly what I thought it would do. Like, even when they brought up, when he said, I'm doing another coming to America, I was like, well, I mean, it's not going to be the first one. Like, it's just not going to happen. Like you can't, you can catch that lightning in the bottle again, but it's very, very rare, I think, to do it in a reboot. Um, so, I was like, cool. It it looks good. Like I think it visually was good. It definitely was a lot going on. Like they tried to fit a lot of concepts in the movie, and it was like, okay, you got a lot happening right now. But I think all in all, 
it it did what it was supposed to do. It, it's definitely a fan service movie. It definitely hit those points. Um, so for me, I enjoyed it in that sense. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I look. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to eviscerate it or nothing, but like, look, at the end of the day, I like, I, I seen the previews and I was just like, okay, this is absolutely a fan movie. This is absolutely what it's going to be. Uh, I could just look at this, just the production shots and everything. Like, oh, okay, this is this. I hope this is not what I'm, I'm, I'm but I, but it's coming to America. So I do want to see this because I could be just tripping. And I was, the, 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 the mm. I'll put it like, like I said, the, to me, the storyline felt, like something that I get where they were going. And if it was not attached to the coming to America brand, I probably would have liked it. That was my problem because I think that's the thing. It's like, if they do like, Oh, it's ET too. And they bring everybody back. It's like, it's awesome. But if ET got wings now and he flying, it's like, I don't, I don't get it. It has nothing to do with the original ET. Like, what is this? You know what I mean? And to me, it's just like, okay, like, like you said, the uh, you know, Prince Prince Akeem is like a massage just now. It's like, uh, you know what I mean? Like the 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 son is just like, okay, he's extra hip hop now. It's like, is this what America is? This type of the world of views right. American. Yeah. And, you know what I mean? The the you know, and it's like, okay, but the daughters, he had three daughters, and all of them are dope, but they don't, of course, they don't get seen by dad. I'm like, I'm a girl dad. I see my daughters. Like, I see the glory that is in them. And I try to cultivate it. So I was like, how they, I, 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 it was just so many conflict and ideas for me. And I was just like, it's almost impossible for me to like this. And it's like, why would you even do that? Like, I get us, like you said, as a cash grab, I, 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 just some things you just don't touch. You know what I mean? And it, it feels like, you know, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom and Crystal Skull. It's like, what are we really doing? You know what I mean? <laughs> just let him go ahead and fade, bro. Like, and if you're going to reboot it, reboot it, you know, but don't, touch you know oh we're gonna bring Hugh Jackman again uh, okay when he comes in with the wheelchair then it's, it is what it is you know what I mean it's like certain certain things it's like come on now like it, it was just too much for me so that's that's my that's my take on it and that's how I feel about it so yeah someone commented I saw the comment from someone said it felt like a Tyler Perry comedy and that's actually very accurate it felt yeah shout out to shout out to Brian Victorious uh, brother from back home and DMV uh yeah yeah. I agree, I agree with him one thousand percent. He also went on to say the comedian DC Two Fly auditioned twice to be Akeem's son and didn't get it. He would have made the movie funnier and the dude was hilarious. I, I, you know, they could have probably brought Cat Williams on. I probably would have still liked it the same. You know, yeah. I, mean? I don't think it was gonna. I don't think it was gonna be that laughter that you got from the first one. It just wasn't like you're comparing it to something else. You know what I mean? It's like. That's why I don't like, like a, reboots and sequels because I yeah. always do that and it's like, uh, it's I mean, like even, if you think of stand up comedians when they do a comedy uh show, it's like every time they come back, they're you're being compared to that last one you did. Some people do it, but if you think of even like Eddie Murphy talking about he wants to do stand up again, I saw Martin Lawrence recent stand up, yeah, so it's a, just not. Yeah, he wasn't hitting it. It ain't the same, you know what I mean? So like all the, you you're gonna lose a step because you're 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 going against your own self and you created an iconic movie and you tried to do another one. Like it it it, it ain't gonna be that. Like you know what I mean? And I think it's not a great thing that I feel like I came in with the lower standard, but I did because it right. it just is what it is. <laughs> I should have came in with a lower. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Kenya Barris wrote the script, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a lot of his shows don't even make me laugh. So I should have probably had a lower expectation that if I don't get laughs out of watching, you know, a lot of his shows, then I probably won't get laughs out of this. So, but but I, for me, I love Black AF. I love Black AF. I thought that was a I love that. I, I love that one too. That was my favorite out of all of his. I mean, what's the one? The uh not blackish, uh whatever ish. What is it? Whatever ish, every Bro everything is everything ish. <laughs> Brown ish has its own like area. It's actually pretty good. Yeah, I was like, I think it has a, a it's lane really that it's filling. It's not really funny for me. It's just yeah. an interesting show. That, but yeah. that's what I mean. I'm not saying that Blackish and Black AF and all of his shows are not 
good. They're good shows. Yeah. I just don't get laughs out of them. I get that. Um, yeah. You lost me at an ish. So I was just like, okay. America ish. He coming to America. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, um, so understanding that you're that you're bit you're, you're you're a very busy person, Jamie. How how are you on time? You you still go with time? Or yeah. okay. All right, we're gonna get we going let's move on to the next one. Just out of respect for your time. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Do you feel that Nate Park is being blackballed treated unfairly? That's a great question. Um absolutely. And I used to think a little different about Nate Parker, but as I've gotten older and as time has passed since he was blackballed, um, you know, for birth of a nation during that whole um, situation, my opinions of him have shifted because I've seen other white male actors, directors, producers, kind of fall into similar scandals or traps that, you know, Nate Parker succumbed to and they've been able to bounce back just fine, mm-hmm. win awards, create TV shows, host SNL, you know, <laughs> they're, they've been able to, um, you know, their careers have not been tainted by their scandal, but um, Nate Parker, for some reason has, like you said, it, essentially has been blackballed. I will say, I think what he did with American Skin was brilliant. And um, that was just a fantastic film. It's a shame that it's not getting more attention. I mean, it should definitely been a film that have been, you know, it should have been campaigned. Um, but, you know, it's just interesting how the media treats black folks compared to white people um, mm. in Hollywood. Because I, I remember when that happened, because obviously Birth of a Nation did really well at Sundance. I think it was like one of the most expensive films that were purchased at Sundance that year. And it was getting a lot of good buzz. And then the trades just hit the internet with the story about him, which wasn't really a bombshell. I mean, everybody knew about it. It's on his Wikipedia page about what happened. Um, and then they had court documents and all of this stuff. And it it was almost like they were trying to, you know, yeah. Smear him, do it, you know, mm-hmm. a smear job on him because of this very black film about black resistance. Um, I mean, I've, I've read Nat Turner's um, many books about Nat Turner and his story is so revolutionary. Um, so, yeah, I, it's just wrong the way I think the media has treated him. And um, it's very disappointing. But I, I, I love the fact that he's not stopping, that he's, he's still going and that he's got a film out right now that, you know, has gotten a lot of good critical acclaim I've seen from at least people within his circles. Cause I've, you know, listened in on panels that he's done on zoom and um, like on clubhouse, he's done chats on American skin. And so um, yeah, he's, he's hanging in there. So good for him. Do you think um, kind of on this same line or level, do you think, the content of American Skin is also a reason it's not getting more nods. Like, do you think if there was a different lead actor, director, like in in that position, another let's throw Michael B. Jordan out there just to throw a name out there that doesn't have that scandal, do you think American Skin would be getting more attention and nods right now? Absolutely. And if it was a white director, it would have gotten more attention. Um, yeah. That, that film hits too close to home for a lot mm-hmm. of people. And it even forces white people to confront themselves when it comes mm-hmm. to uh, mm-hmm. the fear of, of black men, you know? Um, I mean, not to give up, give too much away, but that moment with the cop where he kind of confesses as to why he racially profiled, um, you know, Nate Parker's character, that was a real moment. I, I, and I'm sure there are cops there's people that do like if I think I had heard somewhere um, that every every school should have this film screened. You know, this this film should be screened in every school, and I absolutely believe that. I mean, it it's yeah. very educational. Like people need to know about how the police react to black people in these situations. Um, and even though his film was obviously fictional it's very, very real and happens every day. Um, so 
Yeah. If the, if the nation in some way could have that moment, like I think that's when healing could at least the process could begin. It's not going to like fix it, but that moment, like you said, was so powerful in yeah. the way it was um, captured. Like that is the moment that I think people don't understand needs to happen. Like that has to happen before any healing can happen. The, the actual realization, the actual light bulb that says this is what's happening. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. Yeah. Great film. Yeah, I, and and it's funny. I echo the same thing. I said it, it literally the exact same thing. That this that film is one of very very few uh, films that should be sta- like textbook. This is what Black in America is, and you need to watch this and 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 go with God because yeah. like it literally it, it just like you said. Even though it it is a fictional piece, it's still uh, very much uh, a mirror. It, it, it forces you to look at you, you to look at yourself and look at you know you as a parent to look at yourself like if you're a cop look at yourself like it's very introspect on a lot of different levels and it was it just resonated so so heavily you know what I mean and I I, 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 I just think Nick Parker has a very very unique eye for capturing the soul of what it, uh, 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 of uh, stress and oppression and within within the culture I I, I really do and I think it's unfortunate. That he's being Kaepernicked out of, out of the situation, out of uh, you know Hollywood, because I mean, it, it, he's brilliant, and every every piece he's, he 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 stepped out with, he swung you know for the fence and has knocked it out the park. But like you said, I think press just junks it. Press, you know what I'm saying? Like they go about above and beyond to suppress what his work is, and it's just unfortunate to me. Absolutely. So. Well. Um, in between this, I'm going to throw this one out here, too. How do you feel about Ray Fisher and his stance against Warner Brothers with uh, regard to the Justice League film that he was in? Ray Fisher, if, if fans you don't know, uh, is the black dude who played uh, Cyborg uh, in the uh, the Justice League movie. Um, but what is your thoughts on that, Jamie? Like his stance and do you, do you think it's valid? Do you think, uh, you know, he's tripping or what? I mean, I, I give him a lot of kudos for speaking up and speaking out against, you know, what was going on with Joss Whedon behind the scenes. Um, it's just really unfortunate that he was um, now being, uh, I guess now blackballed as well um, from Warner Brothers because he's not going to be in the next Flash movie. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, I hate to always make this about race, but still it's just like, when we speak up about things or we suffer from some sort of failure, it it has a more detrimental consequence to us as black people than it does for white people. And um, I hope that Ray Fisher has a flourishing career after what's happened. I hope that he's not completely banned from Warner Brothers. I heard that the Zack Schneider cut, I haven't seen it yet, but the Justice League Zack Schneider cut that he has a pretty a uh, meaty role, you know, in it, um, because he was kind of a footnote in the Justice League movie. Um, and then there was supposed to be a cyborg movie at one point, and that yeah. got shelved. So um, I just hope that um, Ray Fisher has a flourishing career, um, because you shouldn't be silenced for standing up for, especially standing up for women and speaking out against someone who's, you know, obviously. Um, being very irresponsible with their authority, um, which from what, you know, the reports are saying, Joss Whedon was, according to so many other people that have been speaking out, mostly women. Um, so, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I stand with Ray Fisher. <laughs> so. I, I get it. I get it. Uh, what did you think of uh, Gina Carino's separation from The Mandalorian? And did you think? Do you think that that uh, they they you know move too quickly, or you know, did they need more information, or, or like, what are your thoughts on that? Um. Well, first of all, I will say, please don't take away my nerd card. I've only seen one episode of The Mandalorian, so I don't know much about her character and her arc in that series. One more um, than me. <laughs> One more than me. You know I want to watch it. We've done recaps on Black Girl Nerds. Thank God. I have 
that can, you know, watch the pop culture stuff for me and put it out for our readers. And I don't have to watch everything. Um, <laughs> but um, you got to be careful with Disney. Disney does not play. I mean, you know, you, you, you got to be careful of what you say, because even though, yes, there's such thing as freedom of speech, um, when you represent a brand, you are an extension of that brand. And uh, working for Disney, especially as a reoccurring character, you know, in a series, in this case for Gina, the Mandalorian, you, you're part of Disney's brand now, you know, and you, you have to be careful of what you say on social media. You have to be careful of your actions, you know, publicly, um, because if you do anything that taints that brand, um, that could affect your, you know, your livelihood working with them. Um, so uh, I'm not a fan of cancel culture. I'm not a fan of that whole thing, but at the same time, um, I get why Disney did what they had to do. Um, and I did see a lot of what she had said and it was not good. <laughs> uh, I don't know why she even said those things and felt compelled to go there. Um, but yeah, you, you, again, if you work for a company, I mean, it, you could be anybody. You could be, you know, someone that works for some big corporation and you're their social media manager or you're, you know, you're someone who is the face of that brand. Um, you, you, you're a part of that brand and um, you just have to be super, super careful of what you say. So I, I get it from Disney situation, why they had to cut ties. Okay. Right. You guys don't have anything to say about that, huh? Well, no. I, so you know, I was, I was, oh, I was gonna, you know, let Baker speak on it. My, my, my look, my thoughts on this is for as far as I, I've seen every episode of The Mandalorian. I fell in love with it from the first episode. I think it's, it's, it's amazing. I love John Favreau. John Favreau is like he started the 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 the, the, the Marvel MCU like mm -hmm. that man by himself. Like you know what I mean? And he gets none of the love he deserves. Uh, with regard to his his craft, um, that's in my opinion. Uh, seeing Gina Carano, like as far as her character on the show, I mean, if they did like season three without her, I don't care. Um, she wasn't that big uh, of a character, not like a fan favorite for me. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like 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 you, I did read some of the things she said. I'm just like okay, but I'm 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 more of a person where. I, I try to look at it from there are always other sides to the story that is being publicized. So, you know what I mean? And I know I have my own biases. There's some of which did I say, some of which did I don't say about things. Uh, and, I, and I'm just like, I wish we all as, as just overall across the world, we just, we just need to be real. You know what I mean? We don't need to be hateful. Yes. But, but be real. You know what I mean? If if something's not right, it's not right. If it's not cool, it's not cool. If, you know what I mean? And if if you have if look, there's people out there that just don't like black people. Okay, that's I'm willing to have that conversation. That's cool. I just let me know as long as you say that, I know I don't need to be bobble with you, but you don't have to be hateful with it. You know what I mean? Right. So I mean, in situations like what what you know some of the things that she said, it was just like okay. I mean, you know, maybe she dated a black guy. I mean, you know, it, it could be it could be any daggone thing. You know what I mean? That led her to that point, or or like the uh, what's the um, Josh Allen from the Buffalo Bills? Like it was like okay, they almost canceled him because and when he was in high school, he said these, you know, racist statements. But here he is now; he's like a star quarterback for the Buffalo Bills. You know what I mean? And it's like people are quick to cancel. Yeah, and I'm, I'm definitely not a fan of cancel culture and, and situations like that is really annoying. Like when people have tweeted or they've said things in their past and then they're being held accountable for it in the present, that yeah. is problematic. I like, for example, the whole um, Kevin Hart situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was really upset about that because I was like, why is he being denied to host the Oscars for tweets that he said? X amount of years ago. And then he apologized for the tweets. And I'm very right. sensitive to the LGBTQ community. But in, in that circumstance, I don't think people should be accountable for what they've said in the past, even if they've, especially if they've apologized, but because we've all done and said things in our past that have been 
problematic. We've said things that are stupid and then we grow, we evolve. I mean, I know that I remember using the term, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of um, spirit animal. Mm. I've used that term. And then someone said to me who, you know, this indigenous um, woman said to me that the term spirit animal is offensive to Native Americans. I did not know that. So there, you know, and, and now I don't use that term because now that I know it's not a term that is, you know, now that I know that it is a term that's offensive to a certain group of people, I'm not going to say that anymore. I'm not trying to defend Kevin Hart's words or actions. I'm just saying that sometimes we say things in our past that are stupid or out of ignorance um, or because we just don't know any better. But then once someone corrects us on that and we apologize and then we move forward, we should not be held and, you know, to the things of our past and, you know, be criminalized for it in the present just because someone's, you know, upset about that and have to stumble on your tweet from 2005 or whatever, you know, so. I think his explanation of it, too, was like, you know, if you saw this, ten, if you had to travel back 10 years ago to find this, like, tweet, like, that what possibly happened is I grew. Like, someone got to me spoke to me and I grew from that situation. So if you're going back and you're still like punishing me for that, what are you really, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, right. do you need to grow and change or do you just want revenge? Right. right. What is this? Like, that's, that's what it boils down to. You know what I mean? Um, it makes me think of something that's going on right now with, uh, and I don't know how y'all, I don't even know how I feel about it just yet with the uh, Sharon Osbourne. I don't oh, know if you yeah. seen kind of her comments yeah. with Piers Morgan and the Meghan Markle situation, and uh, she had a really heated um, comment um, or a, a heated back and forth on um, the show, and like people are now trying to cancel her and say that she needs to be off the show, and uh, you know, I mean, it, it's weird. It's like it's weird. I, I think I, I get it. I get what people are saying, but I think there could be more power in the conversation being had. Right. You know I mean? And they, they had a piece of the conversation on the show, but I think like continuing the conversation and not necessarily canceling, but like having it out, like Donnie, like you said, like, let's keep it real. Let's keep it a hundred. Let's, let's have this storm and norm conversation around it and not just say, well, you need to go, you know what I mean? And that be that. So yeah. interesting. Yeah topic that's still happening. I mean, I look at it from a perspective of, you know, overall, like, let's take the Capitol attack, right? And you got the people who was taking pictures and sitting at Nancy Pelosi desk and walk around with the with the, oh, the, with the dais and, you know, just like, ur, ur, like whatever. It's like, you can't sit there and say that you didn't plan that. You know what I mean? Even if it, not, not say that, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to go take a picture at Nancy Pelosi desk. But no, you were there. And people, you like, you sat and let somebody take a photo of you. You know what I mean? So what did you expect? You can't come back and now you apologize and be like, oh, I learned so much from it. Well, what did you learn? If that's, if you knew that that's what, like, I'm not going to go to my, like, listen, I, I, like, I have a job. I'm not going to go to my, you know, uh, my job tomorrow morning to sit at my boss's desk, the CEO of the damn company, and sit with my feet up on the chair and take pictures and put it on social media. I'm just not. You know what I mean? <laughs> Unless you decide you don't want to be there no more, like yeah, you already got a plan. <laughs> so it, to me, it's it, it's the same it's the same principle because it's like at the end of the day, if you just real about it, look at at the end of the day, you have a bias against these type of people or these type of people, and and I'm I'm be honest with you, I think the the biggest issue more so than anything is classism over racism. Now we still have a lot to deal with 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 regard to racism. Flat out, I'm not. I, you know, I'm black too now. You know what I mean? But classism is the hugest thing that we have a problem with because at the end of the day, people just feel that they're better than you. Period. So it was in the capitalism and all of the you, so destroying. It, country, but yeah, go on. You see what I'm saying? So I mean, like, with all of these things being 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 out there and being said, it's just like, how can you fix anything? If and it's like I, like I, like I, like I tell my, my my girls, it's like, look, you can't. How you triage is how you fix. You can't go to the hospital with a broken leg saying my head hurt. 
You know what I mean? The, the doctor only going to go based off of what you tell them. So you have to be real with yourself to say what the problem is in order to get the effects back to be able to fix it. And I think that that's just a lot a, a lot of the smoke and mirrors of the United States that, that, that creates a lot of the problems that we have because everybody's scared to address the issues. But on top of that, everybody wants to cancel things out immediately or be a part of, oh, well, I you know that? I brought that down myself. You know what I mean? And it's just like it's kind of productive to me. So whatever. That's, I feel like you know. Just speaking of, I think that's where the conversation is, though. It's like going back to the Nate Parker movie. It's like sometimes there does need to be a realization of the problem. Like sometimes people have told themselves so much that it is my head that hurts, even though my leg is broke, that they really believe that it's their head, right? And I think until we force those conversations and we have those aha moments where it's that revelation happens, it has to happen for that person. Like, you can keep telling the person it's actually your leg broken. It's actually your leg. But until they say, oh, shit, it's my leg, you know what I mean? Like, that's when you can start the healing. You know what I mean? But I think that's the issue, too, is this kind of misconception or thought that, oh, it's not. It's it's something else. It's not that. Oh, it can't be that. No, it's not that. You know what I mean? And just like being like, yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's this. Like, oh, you know, we saw this today and we didn't like what we saw. But that's the truth. That's what's going on right now. And until we say, you know what, this is our truth, then we then we can start fixing it. You know what I mean? So it's a lot of work to be done. A lot. But switching gears, let's get back on, on, on it really quick. Uh, what's next for Jamie and or Black Girl Nerds? Great question. Um, I mean, right now I'm just really digging into building this into a business where I can continue having this as my full-time job and, and also to um, hopefully in the future gainfully employ these freelancers into like full-time, you know, staff members. Um, so just really kind of building um, Black Girl Nerds sustainable business uh, we're in a pandemic right now, so we can't do what we used to do. You know, we used to go to the comic book conventions and have our little meetups, and all of those kind of things. So um, hopefully once, you know, things will die down, we can go back to that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I hope that, you know, one day um, Black Girl Nerds will be a business filled with a whole bunch of full-time employees and that, you know, we have just this huge media publication and just huge media conglomerate where, you know, I can travel and, and do so much more than, you know, just talking about geek culture that I can expand into other areas that I'm passionate about, talk about the fintech world and talk about politics and, um, you know, maybe even write a book one day. It's something that I've been wanting to work on. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, Law says, does Jamie still think Grey's Anatomy is great? You know, he can't. He said, Gate. But Gate. Yeah. That's, a, that's a new word. <laughs> I know. I'm so obsessed with Grey's Anatomy um, back then, hanging out in New York. I have not watched Grey's Anatomy in a while because um, I think I heard somebody, like, major character got killed or something. Yeah. Um, but. I do still think it's great. I just have not watched the show in in a, in a while. Like I, I think I'm three seasons behind, so um, or maybe four. Um, but yeah, I still think it's great. I still think Shonda Rhimes, obviously, she's a gem to me. And um, yeah, I, I remember that being one of my shows that I was obsessed with. Yeah. So he came back with what does she think of Shonda Rhimes' move to Netflix? Well, I guess what is that? Uh, Binghamton or Beaverton or whatever the name of the Ego show is. Was it? Oh, Bridgerton. <laughs> Bridgerton. Bridgerton, whatever. That dude was something. It was Breatherton or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bridgerton. It's so funny. It's just so funny how Hollywood works. So, Bridgerton has obviously become like this cult phenomenon. To answer Law's question, mm -hmm. I think it's great that she's at Netflix. She's obviously. Um, done well with Bridgerton, where it's just this huge cult phenomenon. Um, we posted interviews from the cast, and it's one of our highly viewed 
videos on our YouTube channel. Um, so Bridgerton is just massive. So I think Chonda Rhimes going to Netflix was obviously a fantastic idea. Plus she has more autonomy over her work creatively. So I think that that was just a brilliant decision on her part because I'm sure she couldn't make the same executive choices that she did at ABC, mm -hmm. uh, also under Disney's umbrella that she can make over at Netflix. But it's so funny though, because uh, Reggae Jean Page, who's the main lead in that series, I interviewed him a long time ago when he was in the mini series for Roots. Roots did like a reboot mm -hmm. and Chick and George. And I interviewed him back then and he was kind of like, I want to say a nobody, but like nobody was really checking for him. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I interviewed him for for the people because that was another Shondaland show. And um, now I can't touch him with a ten foot pole. <laughs> people, he's hard to get through. I'm like, wow. Because uh, he's like in SNL now, and he's like on Jimmy Kimmel and all these shows. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so that's how it is now. Okay, I mean. Uh, I don't know. People weren't checking for you, Reagan. Like. Don't worry. Your season's coming back. <laughs> hey, I'll say it. Grey's is still great, by the way. Like, my wife loves the show, so I have to sit down and watch it, too. And I don't know how Shonda does it. Like, I feel like that show been on, like, forever. Right. But uh, she finds a way. And, like, I won't, you know, if you're going to catch up, I won't tell you what's going on too much. But, like, she's kept it relevant to what's going on now and like I don't know like I I'm amazed that like she came with other shows after it but that's the one that's still like continuing and going and I don't I feel like I don't even know if she can stop it now the way it feels like it's like no you can't stop it <laughs> <laughs> Law says see she won't have that problem with me later <laughs> okay, I appreciate that Law don't forget about you know us little people when you become a big baby <laughs> director because I'm gonna ask exactly. you for interviews. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And shout out to Law for for Catharsis too. So you know that's definitely another movie that Excellent. he's been considered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I, I gotta say with, with regard to Grey's Anatomy, I, I just listen, I'm not a huge Shondaland fan. I, I'm sorry I'm gonna just go ahead and put that on record and she's gonna have to shoot me in the foot later on. Um, <laughs> But the whole, I, I just seen because, you know, a, my, my baby watches this, like, my, you know, my girlfriend, she watches this and, like, she's religious. Like, she's probably every bit as, as much into it as you, Jamie. Mm -hmm. But Jamie watched these last couple episodes and I'm like, this chick has been at the beach for about three years right now. I, I'm like, I wish she would just, like, what is it with the beach? I'm tired of her with the beach. Can we just go, <laughs> go somewhere else? Like, and she just sit there with the button up, the same button up the whole time. I'm like, yo, it's like a whole year later, bro. Like, what's happening? I don't, I don't. It, it's it's just it be it's too touching for me. I just be like okay, too touching. <laughs> it's just well, too touching. just now get into it in this these past seasons. Or no, I mean, I, I, I've I've been kind of following it with you before. McDreamy got got shot or killed or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like I, you know, I, I know McDreamy. You know, I know what he means to the franchise. You know, I was never a fan of it, but it's like, okay, I can follow it. It's cool. It's not like even like Station 19 or whatever. I, it's like, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not stupid. I follow the joints. Okay, that's, oh, okay, that's, okay, that's, okay, I get it. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool. But these last couple episodes just rubbed my rhubarb the wrong way. I'm like, <laughs> she just, you know, she got to be at the beach this long. And then everybody got to visit her at the beach. Like, what's going on, bro? Like, I don't understand it. It's, and and you know, you know, symbolism. Um, probably it's not even right. writing the show anymore. I would imagine. I think probably at this point, Shonda's just got a whole team of writers mm -hmm. that yeah. writing for her. Because I mean, I remember when I was watching it, Shonda Rhimes was, you know, the was actually actively writing the show. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think I had read somewhere that the like she knew what the series Bible was for the show from beginning to end yeah um so i don't know if she's still like actively like writing scripts at this point in her career because obviously now she's got other stuff going on um but yeah it makes your your sentiments makes me wonder is the show has it fallen off like writing wise he's hating he's I a hater right now he's hating uh, no because no, no the show is like Yes, I do think, like you said, she kind of had the the beginning and the end. I think that's why I was like, I don't think she could stop it if she wanted to because 
She tried once and people was like, oh, no, no, no. You're not stopping <laughs> this show. And then she came back with it. And now it's kind of this ongoing thing. I think there's yeah. symbolism in what she's doing now with the whole beach scene. And, you know, again, I, you know, it, it, it makes sense in what's going on with Gray and why she's there in her head. Like, right. It, it, it just, it makes sense. It's like, to me, I mean, Jamie, I'm going to just give a little break. If you haven't seen that, but just give you a little bit of what's happening. Like she can't go into this like coma and, and then just come out of it. Mm -hmm. Like it had to be some kind of time lapse of like, she's been in it for a while. Like, you know, she she had COVID and like got it. Like it, it's like it had to be that way to me. Like if she would have got it and then just came right out, like it would have been like, OK, that didn't make sense. She was at the beach one day, saw, you know, Derek and then woke up. No, she has to be there. Like, but what is the mind thinking? Like when people come out of the coma a lot, a lot of times, not me. Well, not a lot of, you know, if people come out of the coma, like a lot of times you hear that they say well, I was. It felt like a long dream. It felt like I was, I could hear people, but, you know, I was here. So I feel like that's what she's depicting. So okay. Okay. that's my defense. I got yeah. you, Shonda. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know the character. So don't, don't spoil it for me because eventually I'll, I'll rewatch. But yeah. um, I do remember, what was it, season four when the series jumped the shark on Meredith's character when she when she died, remember mm -hmm. like, temporarily, and then she came back. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just like, "Why? Why are you guys doing this?" Um, <laughs> so yeah, I guess th there's that occasional <laughs> moment in various seasons where they, I guess, they do jump the shark and they have a character either die or they die and they come back, and it's just some kind of crazy storyline. And you're like, "What? What are y'all doing right now?" Um, but yeah, now I gotta go and start. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Get, back, get back into it. Binge watch. I know, I know. There's, there's so much television out there. It's so hard to keep up. And I'm watching like films and like now sometimes it feels laborious because I have to watch films. And yeah. so um, I, it's hard to even sneak in some of the stuff that I really, really want to see. Um, yeah. He's, Law said, I don't know what kind of coma Nick Baker is talking about, but my comas, we don't have that at the beach. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't even gonna say that. I was just gonna let it ride off in a good sunset. But I mean, yeah. Just, I, haven't like, had my, I haven't had one yet, so I can't really, you know. You said yet. Oh my goodness. Just, <laughs> just, just, like, like, just like, think about it like this. This is my thought process. You, I think you put you put the the, the hammer on the head with the with. Meredith died 15 times already. It's like, I, I mean, you know, either she's extremely resilient or like drinks a ton of Red Bull. I don't know. What, either or. It's just like, bro, like at the end of the day. All right. Cool. Hey, man. Yeah. Yeah. Died, Jason died. If they can and come it, back, so can murder Greg. But it's a horror. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it wasn't here nor there. You know, but these characters, it, it hurts. It Thank hurts. you. Like of, well, at least Game of Thrones keeps it real. Like once you did, you did. That's yeah, that's, they, yeah they don't play. <laughs> they didn't play at all. Yeah, they don't play. Them I wasn't. Really dead. I wasn't a fan of that series too, by the way. But that's neither what? Oh no! You know what? You know. It's okay. What? I, I had to watch it. I was forced to watch the, the whole 10 seasons of it in like uh, three weeks. And it, it was just like, uh, it, I, I got the, when I actually got, I was like, oh, this is actually dope was the last season. And then the way they did the last season was like, bro. Like, the way they did they the were, last season was kind of low-key trash, but yeah. They, they, they ended with the Battle of the Night King. If they ended with that, I'd have been like, okay, everything makes sense. But then after that, I was like, bro, all right, I'm done. So. <laughs> You see, I, you, you need to have me, man. I'm trying to tell you, you can be your double get guest writer on one of the joints, and it, it'd be very eventful, but it, it'd be colorful for sure. <laughs> you know what? We we come. We're about to get to the end, but Jamie, I want to ask you, what did you think about Antebellum? Donnie, don't say nothing. Woo! Okay. Um, I don't want to get no hate online for this. I, I don't want y'all to come after me on the socials, but I liked it. I actually liked Antebellum. Okay. I don't know why so many people had hate for that movie. I don't and know why. I didn't see the plot twist coming. Like people were like, oh, I saw the plot twist a mile away. I didn't. That shocked me. So I enjoyed it. Yeah. I think 
I think somebody fabricated that because I, and I, I'm trying to tell you, I sit and I study. I'd be like, man, well, watch this don't probably happen. And most of the time it does. That one, I was like, they did a good job. Yeah. A, friend of, mine, a friend of mine was like, um, um, yeah, they shouldn't have put that out there like that. Cause now white folks are going to start getting ideas. <laughs> Apparently, man, <laughs> like, wow. these parties happen. Apparently, these parties happen. Man, and they didn't whole, Like, part yeah. of, you know the setup like yeah like, yeah white folks gonna start getting ideas from this movie i was like uh yeah. they didn't got <laughs> they didn't got what, what you call it with it uh what's the name the bachelor with it well, they would do the, the the one of the lead yeah. the girls that she been at one of the antebellum parties antebellum party wow yeah. so, yeah. It, so it really is a real thing yeah, yeah. that's what i'm saying it's happening and yeah. antebellum is the actual park i think Oh well, dang. Okay, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Know that. The plot. <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> so yeah, like like I said, like he said, Kudo, he said, shut up, because I I won't go, I won't shut up about it. I think Antebellum is right there with American Skin. I think it's one of those movies that look, you need to see this here because this. Like is here. He yeah. absolutely like was like y'all got to watch it like for weeks, I, and then I wouldn't watch it, and then I I finally watched it, and I was like, okay, okay. I didn't. I didn't see it coming, like y'all said. I didn't see it coming. It was like, oh. I mean, I think okay. what from the folks that didn't like it, a lot of people were saying they didn't like the. Um, they felt there was a lot of black trauma porn going on with the film, like especially the opening scene with the mm -hmm. slave getting, you know. Um, I mean, I don't want to spoil a movie for anybody that hasn't seen it, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I didn't see it that way. I didn't see it as trauma porn. I just, I just saw it as white people being just absolutely terrible, mm -hmm. um, horrible people, and the history of them being a, a terrible people with you know what happened with slavery. So I, I didn't see it that way. Uh, but it was it was panned not only by critics but by a lot of fans of the movie too. And I was just like. I liked it. I didn't, I didn't see any issue with it. So, I, listen, I don't understand how you could pan that movie, but love us. I, 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 man, I wanted to take us and box it up and throw it and sit it oh, up by the curb. Like us? I wanted to put it by the curb. Really? I'm gonna find one of the dopest, the, the dopest, most sturdiest trash bags and put and put it in there, tie it up in a bow and a nice, real pretty, and put it on the, on the curb. I, I was like, bro, what like that you didn't like about us. Everything. Wow. Everything. Because it was like okay, what like at the okay, so all of, so all of these people, right? Which is supposed to be the sorry spoilers people. Uh, all of these people, I guess what they call them, um, uh, doppelgangers. The doppelgangers, right? yeah. So all these people come out of this one little door on this beach, and this little merry go like behind the merry go round. So you just make sure you close that door. We good. You know what I'm saying? But then let it go. Like then it's like a whole bunch of them. Now at the end of the movie, it's like okay, they all we all gonna stay. What is this? We are America. Like we we are the world. Like what's going on? Like okay, everybody come together, hold hands at the end. It's like what? How you know, beaches? That's what that is. You gotta watch. It's it's you gotta enjoy the beach. Through it several different times, sometimes to kind of get the metaphorical meanings behind I saw the doppelgangers, that. them on the you know the last scene of the film because that's sort of um. There's an Easter egg at the very beginning of the film that connects with the that part. The so bookshelf. Then, what's that? You talking about it with the bookshelf? Yeah. Yes. You know what I'm talking I've about. Seen it four times. Oh, okay. So then you get me. I mean, I, I, yeah. I liked it because of the Easter eggs. I like the little hints that you know Jordan Peele drops in his movies, and you're like, wow, I didn't, I didn't see it that way. You know, like the yeah. whole fruit loops and the milk scene with. Get out! You know? what, what, I'm not gonna lie. I'll be having to get a study. Get out, like stuff like that. I think <laughs> it's but, but that would see. Okay, Get Out. That's a whole different movie. Get Out. I'm like, I love Get Out. That is that is you know classic cinema. That's Hitchcockian, right? But but like I said, it to me it stood for something. Not just oh we got we just gonna do this random, uh, huh? Like that. That's what I left. It was like why. Why do I not care about any of this? You would know what I mean? Like it better if you didn't see Get Out. I probably, you know what, and I'm glad you said that. I pro that's probably what it was because I, I mentioned I was like, you know, if I probably didn't see Get Out, I probably would have liked Get Out. 
I mean, uh, uh, us. Uh, yeah. But it was just the whole thing because the one thing I did know for uh, okay, Easter egg. Sorry, was <laughs> I knew that uh, the the lead uh, actress wasn't the the lead actress. I knew that for a week. So it was just like, okay, how are we making this work though? So I stayed to watch it, trying to figure it out. The first time, I'm talking about the first time. I was like, oh yeah, that's the that's that's not the same person. But I just didn't know how or why. Hmm. So then once we got to the story, it was just like, okay. So it's like Winston Duke one of them too. Uh, this, I think that's his name, right? Winston Duke yeah. or whatever. Mm-hmm. So is Winston Duke one of them? Okay, well, all right, well, what about the kids? Well, what's going on with the okay? So, when the, the, okay, but the neighbors though, so the neighbors get what? So it's not okay, so it's just not black people. Like, it was just, too, it was, it, it was like, if you had, it's like if somebody was like, yo, he, I want to give you a, a make a movie, I want it to be a thriller, and you got a four million dollar budget. No, that's what it felt like with us to me. Okay, sorry, the eviscerated, but again, see, this is why I can't be a film critic because you know what I'm saying. Um... I've seen, exactly the first why you four, be. I've seen the first four episodes. Um, wait till them comes out. Mm-hmm. Like that. I haven't seen it all. I haven't seen the ending, but um, them is the new Amazon series. Uh, yeah. Lil Marvin is the director. Lena Waithe is producer. So it's oh, in yeah. kind I of heard. us universe. Um, that's interesting. Okay. okay. I'll, ch- I'll check it out. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. What advice would you give to someone trying to get into your field? Sorry that we had to go ahead and, you know, I'm crying and everything. I had to get on to that, <laughs> that, that, that. Is that what a burrito awesome in your man. hand? What is that in your hand? Oh, this is, I'm sorry. This is a, uh, a rag. Oh, I thought you had, why is he waving a burrito around? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, what advice would I give to someone trying to get in my field? Uh First and foremost, make sure you know exactly what it is that you want to do and what your reason is for doing it. Um, I mean, is this something you're passionate about? Don't think about it as, okay, I want to get in this for the money or I want to get in this for the cloud or, you know, no, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, Because if I wanted to do this for the money, then uh, I'd be doing something else that actually makes me money. (laughs) Um, But I think um, you really want to focus on your passion and you'd be willing to do something for many, many hours of the day where you're not earning something, where you're not making an income right off the bat, right? Uh, So so my advice is focusing on your journey, your path. Uh, Don't look at what someone else is doing. Don't look at what, you know, how successful someone else is and trying to mirror their success because we all have our own paths and we're all built to do something different, you know, in this world. Um, so that would definitely be my advice is just focus on your unique identity because there's always going to be an audience of people that's going to be attracted to you because of what you bring out into this world. Um, so that should be the focus, not again, trying to look at, you know, someone else's lane next to you on the racetrack and seeing how fast they're going. Mm. I love that. I'm, I'm, I'm about probably, you, Hey, you got that one. Cause that needs to be on this week. Okay, you you you, you muted. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that was probably a great statement on mute. That was like fill in your own, fill in the blank. No, I said I'm literally writing it down as we speak. Yeah. So we have this that, thing that's called two flu quotes. When people give us like a great nugget, we try to we we post that. So I'm writing your your quote down. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So this great, great advice. Uh, definitely, uh, thank you for, for thank you for your time because I know we extremely out of pocket with the time for you, uh, and we actually have one more question. But uh, definitely, uh, you g- gave great insight, uh, and this was a great conversation because I love film just as much as I love sports. So I've always been a film geek. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm good. Where can people uh, connect with you? Like, uh, you know, uh, links. Uh, and also, if you got any shout outs, anybody that you want to acknowledge, man, throw it out there in the universe. <laughs> um, blackgirlnerds.com is the website. Definitely go to the website. If you scroll to the bottom, you can actually sign up to be a part of our newsletter. We have a newsletter that goes out every week. So 
there's a lot of information about stories that you may not have been updated throughout the week and also we do giveaways. Um, so check that out. You can also connect with me on the socials. We're on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So it's at Black Girl Nerds on all of those platforms. Uh, we have a weekly podcast. Episodes come out every Monday. So you can listen to us on all of the major podcast apps, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, Spotify. Uh, so definitely check us out there. And um, if you want to support us, we do have a Patreon. Uh, so definitely, you know, if you find that our content is something that you, you know, feel very connected with and you want to help us build and grow as a brand and as a business, um, you can go to patreon.com forward slash black girl nerds. Um, and then we also have really cute merchandise. <laughs> so you can go to our store. Um, it's on blackgirlnerds.com. And if you click on store, you can go there and get some, you know, really cute avatars, of black girl nerds, the black girl nerds logo, t-shirts, caps, stickers, all kind of fun stuff, um, you know, that you can check out there. Um, and, you know, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to be a part of your show and, and to talk movies. It's, it's my jam. That's what I've always been doing. I remember back in the day, you know, in New York, chilling with you guys, chilling with law, like we would just talk about movies, you know, and dissect a film. And um, it's just great to have those kind of conversations with people that love movies as much as I do. So um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Baker, you, you want to say something like you? I don't, I don't want to. My dog just ran out here. You know, you got to, the dog uh -oh. jump on me, had to, had to get him down. Um, no, Jamie, <laughs> like, definitely appreciate you coming on. Uh, it definitely was a great conversation. Uh, we can always look at the time and be like, yeah, that was a good one. Like, it was a good conversation right there. Um, not that the shorter ones aren't, but. Um, appreciate all your thoughts opinions like the nuggets like i said i was getting caught up in the conversation of almost being a viewer and in the conversation so like i appreciate uh, everything you brought today um thanks to everyone who's watching um subscribe youtube channel make sure you subscribe go binge watch some uh some other shows that we got um uh, yeah donnie yeah. with that close us out uh, yeah, listen. Uh, like, uh, again, I agree, uh, Jamie. Thank you. Uh, you don't. You don't even under, understand how this satisfies me, man. Like, I, 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 I have a Simon Cowell and the Daggone movie experience, bro. Like, I swear, I, I eviscerate shit. That's what I do. You know what I mean? And I just, I love the opportunity to get on to speak with people about how I see a film because I, I don't know. I don't know why I see it that way. I just see things a certain kind of way, um, and I got that really from from. Baker and Law, like really just having conversations with them. And I do remember we call our, 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 our conversations back in, you know, that, that New Year's Eve. It, the, the, the evening didn't turn out the way I wanted it to because I was off. <laughs> but, that's, that's nothing that, you know, that's a different conversation. But uh, definitely want to say thank you for your time. Uh, I respect and admire everything that you've built. Uh, kudos, Black Sister, doing her thing. Uh, much appreciated for that. Um, and it, you know, if you need, need like a Charlemagne the critic on and then, you know, or like as a guest host or something like that, feel free to bring in the two, the two flu West crew. So we come in, I'd, I'd be more than happy to just go ahead and bottom something out because I'd be like, yo, I don't like it, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be that guy, you know, because I just I don't like something, I don't like it, you know, right. but, but I can tell you why, you know, and how to fix it, right? But, you know, that's neither here nor there, but no, nah, uh, like I said, all jokes aside, thank you for your time, um, and your presence and your energy. Uh, it was great exchange energy, energy energy with you today. And um, as Baker said, man, everybody who tuned in, thank you uh, for those who who uh, was in the chat room as well as those who, who have watched, are watching, or will watch. We appreciate you wholeheartedly. Click like and subscribe, both to Black Girl Nerds as well as to Flu West. Um, you know, uh, we do this every Sunday, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Pacific time, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, one last go. Anybody? anybody you just let the, let the planes fly. Are you? I'm, yeah, we okay. We're gonna do it. Let the planes fly. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>